Hello and welcome back Discovery Learners to another episode of Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day program. Yes, it's I, Teacher Liz, your host again once more for November 12, 2020. In today's show, I got some interesting facts that might blow your mind, cool places and landmarks to see inside Ethiopia, and cute animals to learn about. Be sure you tune in every day to the live Zoom sessions provided to you on a daily basis by the Discovery Day Program's educational team. So let's go ahead. Let's start the show. And now for our daily observances. Our first observance is National Chicken Soup for the Soul Day. National Chicken Soup for the Soul Day celebrates who you are and how you get there. Take time to nurture your soul on November 12th. A little chicken soup does a lot of good. It's warm and hearty. As we cup our hands around the bowl, the heat radiates into our bodies. The steam hits our face with a comforting aroma. Similar to what chicken soup does for our bodies, the regular nurturing of our souls benefits our health. Whether you pick up a book, meditate, or go for a long walk, reflect on who you are and your achievements. So how do we observe chicken soup for the soul day? Celebrate you! Have some chicken soup and read an inspiring story. Tell an inspiring story to a friend or family member. It will lift their spirits and remind them that you care about them. Listen to some soulful music. Watch a movie with an uplifting message. Or you can pause here and write down the recipe to make some chicken soup at home. Do you like chicken soup, Discovery Learners? What kind of veggies do you like in your chicken soup? Let me know in the comment section below. Our next observance is... National Pizza with the Works Except Anchovies Day. Oh boy. National Pizza with the Works Except Anchovies Day says, Hold the fishes, please. Anchovy lovers, move aside. On November 12th, all other pizza lovers get their due and pile on their toppings. This annual pizza holiday gets a spotlight with olives, pepperonis, sausages, peppers, and onions. How about mushrooms? Bacon? Or pineapple? Approved. Just no fishy business on this national day. Or no pizza for you. <laughs> Classified as an oily fish, anchovies are a family of small, common saltwater forage fish. There are 144 species found in the Atlantic and Indian Pacific Oceans. Anchovies are small, green fish. They have blue reflections that caused by silver long stripes, which begin at the base of their fin. Traditionally, anchovies are processed in a salt brine and then packed in oil or salt, resulting in a strong, characteristic flavor. Optionally, they've been pickled in vinegar, giving anchovies a milder taste. Although people love it on their pizza, it's not for everyone, especially today. National Pizza with the Works except Anchovies Day. So now that we know a little bit more about anchovies, let's learn a little more about pizza itself. In ancient Greece, the Greeks covered their bread with oils, herbs, and cheese. Some believe this practice is the beginning of pizza. In Byzantine Greek, the word is spelled pita, meaning pie. The Romans developed a sheet of dough topped with cheese and honey. They also flavored it with bay leaves. Modern pizza began in Italy as the Neapolitan flatbread. The original pizza used only mozzarella cheese. The mozzarella was produced in Naples and usually the highest quality buffalo mozzarella variant. In 1997, the United States produced an estimated 2 billion pounds of pizza cheese annually. The first United States pizza establishment opened in 1905 was in New York, Little Italy. Americans love pizza, so much so it's one of our favorite meals. Now that you know all the ways pizzas are made, just be sure to leave the fishing pole at home. Because this holiday is called National Pizza with the Works Except Anchovies Day. Understood? So how do we observe National Pizza with the Works Except Anchovies Day? Whoa, boy, that's a mouthful. Well, for one, today will be a great day to order some pizza and topping it off with the maximum amount of toppings. Anything but anchovies. You can even explore the different types of crust that most pizza places offer. Like thin crust, stuffed crust, hand tossed. Now is your chance to try it all. So what kind of pizza do you like, Discovery Learners? I for one love mushrooms and pineapple on my pizza. 
How about you? Let me know in the comment section below. Another observance for today is National French Dip Day. Yes, on November 12, warm up some owl juice and celebrate National French Dip Day. Served up hot, tender slices of beef or pork on a French roll make up a delicious sandwich. Sometimes cheese is added. However, the key ingredients are owl juice and spicy mustard. The combination of tender beef swimming in flavor and a bath pan drippings absorbed into the crusty roll makes a French dip a decadent multi-napkin experience everyone needs to have. And if you never had one before, now's the day to try it. Some of the restaurants where you can try French dip is a sandwich shop called Arby's. You ever been to Arby's? Order up a sandwich, and when your order arrives, apply a generous helping of mustard. Next, dunk your sandwich into the owl juice for two to three seconds. Permit the bread to soak up the delicious owl juice. Be prepared for a flavor experience when you take your first bite of the French dip. So how do you plan on observing National French Dip Day? Let me know in the comment section below. On this day in history. Today, in 1966, Buzz Aldrin takes the first space selfie, a photo of himself performing extravehicular activity in space during the Gemini program. The Gemini 12 was a 1966 crewed space flight in NASA's Project Gemini. It was the 10th and final crewed Gemini flight, the 18th crewed American space flight, and the 26th space flight of all time including X-15 flights over 54 nautical miles. Commanded by Gemini 6, veteran James A. Lovell, the flight featured three periods of extravehicular activity by rookie Buzz Aldrin, lasting a total of 5 hours and 30 minutes. It also achieved the fifth rendezvous and fourth docking with the Agena target vehicle. Gemini 12 marked a successful conclusion to the Gemini program, achieving the last of its goals by successfully demonstrating that astronauts can effectively work outside the spacecraft. This was instrumental in paving the way for the Apollo program to achieve its goal of landing a man on the moon by the end of the 1960s. On November 12, 1966, Buzz Aldrin was on the Gemini 12 mission, a precursor to the Apollo missions. He perched a camera that he had on board the craft on the edge of a hatch, lifted his helmet sun visor, and captured the first selfie in space, with the Earth sitting right beneath him. Aldrin had to open the pilot's hatch in order to capture the image. As he took the picture, he said, and I quote, So we had the camera and we couldn't shoot this through the window. It had to be mounted on the spacecraft firm, so it wouldn't be shaking. And Jim Level would carefully point it in the right direction, shut off the thrusters so that they wouldn't flash during the time of exposure. I took a few pictures of things as we went over, and then I thought, I wonder if I could take a picture of me with the ultraviolet film. So I turned around, clicked the camera, and it turned out pretty good." End quote. Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong became the first two people to walk on the moon three years later. Today, in 1964, Paula Murphy sets the female land speed record, reaching speeds of over 200 miles per hour. In 1964, Paula Murphy was hailed as the fastest woman on wheels. She earned that title with a remarkable performance on the Utah's Bonneville Salt Flats in one of Art Arpon's backyard-built jet-powered cars. Having never laid eyes on a jet-powered racer before that November 1964 morning, Murphy nonetheless blasted through the USAC timing clocks at 243.441 miles per hour establishing a women's world record. During that era, serious female racers like Murphy had to battle through walls of discrimination in order to compete at all. Even then, they were usually relegated to powder puff races, exhibition runs, and women's records. When the Ohio-born Murphy started racing sports cars at the invitation of a fellow employee from the McCord Corp in North Hollywood, California, she had to run in the ladies' events only. In 1956, Murphy won the first such race she competed in driving an Alfa Romeo. Later, she moved to the Birdcage Maserati, winning often in that car. And by 1963, Murphy was able to compete against men and won while driving an F-Production Class Lotus owned by Frank Jacobs. 
That same year, she attracted the attention of STP's Bill Dredge, who invited her to participate in the long-distance record attempts in various Studebaker models, working with a friend and a fellow racer, Barb Neeland, and the Granatelli brothers. The record-breaking bombardment saw 370 marks fall. Her personal best was a 161 mile per hour run in an Avanti, earning her the record in Offon's car. As Paula Murphy began to break world records, she also started to break barriers as well. And in 1966, Murphy was licensed as the first woman funny car driver. Most drag racing organizations were reluctant to expose a female to the dangers of high-speed class races. But Murphy had the support of two drag racing luminaires, Don Garlitz and Tom McEwen. They signed her UDRA license, where she raced until the NHRA admitted her. This was a significant event that laid the groundwork for women competing in all forms of motorsports today. Notable figures born on this day. Our first notable figure is Anne Hathaway. Born November 12, 1982 in New York City, New York. This American actress who started in The Princess Diaries and The Devil Wears Prada also won an Academy Award for her performance in Les Miserables. Her other major films include Alice in Wonderland, The Dark Knight Rises, Valentine's Day, and most recently, she starred as the Grand High Witch in the movie Witches. She turns 38 years old today. Happy birthday, Anne. Our next notable figure is Ryan Gosling. Born November 12, 1980 in London, Canada. This Canadian actor, musician, writer, and director first started his career on appearances of TV programs such as Are You Afraid of the Dark, Goosebumps, and The Mickey Mouse Club. He has also received Academy Award nominations for Best Actor in roles in Half Nelson and La La Land. He also starred in films as The Notebook, Drive, Blue Valentine, and Lars and the Real Girl. He turns 40 years old today. Wow! Happy birthday, Ryan! Our next notable figure is Neil Young. Born November 12, 1945 in Toronto, Canada. This legendary folk singer responsible for songs including Old Man, Heart of Gold, Harvest Moon, and Alabama. Apart from his solo career, he was a member of the bands Buffalo Springfield and Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. He was inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame twice, once for his solo career and another time as a member of Buffalo Springfield. He turns 75 years old today. Wow! Happy birthday, Neil! And our last notable figure is Wallace Shawn. Born November 12, 1943 in New York City, New York. This American comedic actor and writer is best well known for his role in The Princess Bride. As a playwright, he created Aunt Dan and Lemon and the Distinguished Mourner. He also lent his voice for Disney Pixar films such as the Toy Story franchise, The Incredibles, the Disney movie, The Goofy Movie, and The Haunted Mansion. He turns 77 years old today. Happy birthday, Wallace. Come along, Discovery Learners, and we will see the landmarks of the world. As we continue our journey of discovery through Ethiopia, here are some landmarks you should see, starting with Jinbar Falls. One of the tallest waterfalls in Africa is little known Jinbar Falls, which is more than 500 meters high. The waterfall is located in one of the most dramatic locations of Simeon Mountains in the Geek Abyss. This narrow, canyon-like abyss is considered to be up to 800 meters deep. The Jinbar River, which is about 9 kilometers long, collecting the participation of the most northern part of the Simeon Plateau. This land is covered with unusual ecosystem, alpine grasslands dominated by giant lobleas, while deeper in the valleys grows a forest of erica. Next up is the Urta Ale Lava Lakes. Urta Ale is a continuously active basaltic shield volcano in the far region of northeastern Ethiopia. Urta Ale is 2,011 feet high, with one or sometimes two active lava lakes. 
at the summit which occasionally overflow on the south side of the volcano. It is notable for holding the longest existing lava lake, present since the early years of the 20th century. Volcanoes with lava lakes are very rare. There are only eight in the world. The term Erta Ale means smoking mountain. In the local Afar language, and its southernmost pit is known locally as the gateway to hell. I don't know about a gateway to hell, but I surely know I'm not going swimming in that lake anytime soon because, you know, the lava. The next landmark you should see is another one with volcanic origin and actually not too far from the Erte Ali mountain range in Ethiopia, the Dalal Salt Flats. Dalal is a cinder cone volcano in the Donakil Depression. It was formed by the intrusion of balsic magma, miocene salt deposits, and subsequent hydrothermal activity. All that to say, this place is very hot. There's a volcano underneath the ground, which heats the water on the surface. In some spots, there are water geysers that shoot out hot sprays of water. The heated water rapidly crystallizes as the water evaporates. The characteristic white, yellow, and red colors are the result of sulfur and potassium salts colored by various ions. This seems to be a very interesting place, you know, to look at. I don't know about visiting that place in real life. I do know that there are tours available and people do work there mining some of the minerals found at the Dalal Salt Flats. Next up on our list is the Valley of Awash. The Awash Valley contains one of the most important groupings of paleontological sites on the African continent. The remains and fossils found at this site is the oldest of which date back for at least 4 million years. Wow, that's a long time ago. The Lower Awash Valley Paleoanthropological Site is located 300 kilometers northeast of Addis Ababa, in the west of Afar Depression. The most spectacular discovery in this area came in 1974, when 52 fragments of a skeleton enabled the famously named Lucy to be reconstructed. This is the place where they found a large quantity of fossilized humanoid and animal bones in a remarkable state of preservation, the most ancient of which were at least 4 million years old. This valley produced the most complete set of remains of a hominid skeleton, nicknamed Lucy, dating back 3.2 million years. The famed skeleton of Lucy has been used to prove the ancestor origin for the Homo sapiens species, which is humans. Wow, that's pretty cool. This is the place where they found it. Our next landmark, which is our last one, but the most interesting one, is the Bete Georgis of Lalibela. Located in Lalibela, Ethiopia, it is considered the Ethiopian Jerusalem, featuring a church completely carved out of a single rock. Lalibela is a town named after a king of the same name. The king ordered the construction of 11 monolithic stone torches found in the town today. Lalibela's goal was to create a new Ethiopian Jerusalem. The Bete Georges is by far the most spectacular of these churches. It is carved out of the ground and shaped from the inside and out. It is one unbroken piece of stone. Bete Georges is connected to the other sunken stone churches through a series of elaborate tunnels. The church is cut 40 feet down, its roof forming the shape of a Greek cross. Inside the church, there is a curtain that shields the Holy of Holies and the priest displaying books and paintings to visitors. In one of the arms of the cruciform-shaped church is a replica of the Ark of the Covenant. Wow, this is a really cool place and it's amazing. This entire building is carved out of stone and one piece of stone nonetheless. Pretty cool. Ethiopia is a very old country. In fact, one of the oldest with many things to see but just not enough time to cover it all. But what we did see was pretty amazing. Ethiopia is outstanding. Here's the animal of the day. Today's animal is the jackal. Jackals are medium-sized omnivorous animals within the canine family. The canine family includes wolves and the domestic dog. While the word jackal has been historically used for many small canines, in modern use it commonly refers to three species. The closely related black-backed jackal and the side-striped jackal of sub-Saharan Africa and the golden jackal of south-central Eurasia, which is more closely related to other members of the canine family. Jackals can survive in deserts, 
savannas, grasslands, marshes, brushlands, woodlands, and the mountains. Certain populations of jackals are in danger due to habitat loss and hunting. Jackals are opportunistic omnivores. Predators are small to medium-sized animals and proficient scavengers. Their long legs and curved canine teeth are adapted for hunting small mammals, birds, and reptiles. And their large feet and fused leg bones give them a physique suited for long distances, running, capable of maintaining speeds up to 9 miles per hour for extended periods of time. Jackals are more active during the dawn and dusk of the day. Their most common social unit is a monogamous pair, which defends their territory from other pairs vigorously by chasing intruding rivals and marking landmarks around the territory. The territory may be large enough to hold some young adults, which stay with their parents until they establish their own territories. Jackals may occasionally assemble in small packs, for example, to scavenge a carcass, but they normally hunt either alone or in pairs. The English word jackal dates back to 1600s. It derives from the French word chacal, derived from the Persian word shogal, which in turn is derived from the Sanskrit word meaning the howler. At night, jackals howl to communicate with each other. The howl can be quite bothersome to humans. People have often described the noise as sounding like a loud crying or even a siren. An adult jackal is about 3 feet long, including a tail, and it can weigh up to 15 to 24 pounds. A jackal's fur color depends on what species it is. The golden jackal and African golden wolf are usually yellow pale gold. The black backed jackal is rusty red with a black back. The side striped jackal is grayish with a white tipped tail and a stripe on each side of its body. And like I mentioned earlier, jackals either live alone, in pairs, or in groups called packs. They hide during the day and come out to dust to hunt. They eat small animals and plants. While hunting in packs, jackals can catch large animals as big as sheep and antelope. Jackals also follow lions that are hunting. Once the lion has eaten and gone, the jackals will move in and eat the scraps that are left. These noisy little jackals are very resourceful animals. I think they're pretty interesting. And their pups are super cute. But what do you think of the jackal, Discovery Learners? Let your answers be known in the comment section below. The Plant of the Day Today's plant is the jackalberry tree. The jackalberry is also known as African ebony. It is a large evergreen tree found mostly in the African savannas. Jackals are fond of the fruit, hence the common names. The jackalberry is also closely related to the persimmon. Mature trees have dark gray fissured bark. An adult tree reaches the average height of 18 feet. Although occasionally some trees have been reported reaching up to 75 feet tall. Wow. The foliage is dense and dark green with oval shaped leaves, which are often eaten by grazing animals such as elephants and buffalo. The tree flowers in the rainy season. Its flowers are white to cream colored. The jackalberry tree will bear fruit in the dry season and these are eaten by many wild animals, especially the jackal. The fruits are oval shaped yellow or purple when ripe, and about an inch and a half in diameter, preferring deep sandy soils in the savanna. Jackalberry trees often grow on termite mounds. These trees have a cooperative living style with termites. The termites aerate the soil around the roots, but do not eat the living wood. In turn, the tree provides protection for the termites. The jackalberry is a traditional food plant in Africa. This fruit has potential to improve nutrition, boost food security, foster euro development, and support sustainable land care. The jackalberry is edible for humans. Its flavor has been described as lemon-like, with a chalky consistency when it's unripe, and sweet and fleshy when it is ripe. On average, the fruit contains about 2 to 5 brown seeds. It is said most people prefer letting them dry before eating and the dry ones are stored and consumed as a snack when the fresh one goes out of season. They are sometimes preserved and can be dried and grounded into flour and are often used for brewing beer and brandy. The jackalberry actually has medicinal uses as well. The leaves, bark, and roots of the tree contain tannins, which can be used as a styptic to stop bleeding. 
The roots are consumed to purge parasites and are thought to be a remedy for leprosy. The wood of the jackalberry tree is also useful. It is almost impervious to termite damage. The heart of the wood is fine-grained and strong and often used for wood floors and often made into wooden furniture. Sometimes the trunks of the trees are hollowed out and carved into canoes. The wood ranges in color from light reddish brown to very dark brown. Wow, these are very interesting trees. Almost every part of the tree can be used. What do you think of the jackalberry tree discovery learners? Let me know in the comment section below. And now for the word of the day. Today's word is fossil. It's a noun. It means the remains or impression of a prehistoric organism preserved in petrified form or as a mold or cast in rock. Fossil. Our next word of the day is tradition. It's a noun. It means the transmission of customs or beliefs from generation to generation or the fact of being passed on this way. Tradition. Let's take a look at the art of the day. The art for today is Ethiopian basket weaving. Basket weaving is one of the oldest human crafts found throughout the centuries in numerous forms across countless cultures, peoples, and groups. Woven baskets rank with pottery and textiles as among the first and most versatile objects to be created by human hands. In many African nations, as in other places around the world, there remain a wide variety of basket weaving traditions. Starting with the Mazab, this relatively tall, wide-bottomed basket is a mainstay of most Ethiopian homes and Ethiopian restaurants. It brings a touch of traditional culture to the dining experience. What makes the Mazab unique is its primary function not to hold food or storage, but to act as a dining surface for people to eat from. The other outstanding feature of these baskets is amazing color palettes and mesmerizing patterns woven into each piece. But like most global objects with long history, the Mazab can also do so much more than what it shows on the surface. It can also tell you things about the place and time it comes from, the evolution that it's gone through, and even the ways the people have changed along the way. For centuries, basket weaving has been an important art form for the Harari, one pursued primarily through, possibly not exclusively, by women of the higher social classes. The material from which the baskets are woven consists of a number of different types of dry grass or straw, meager, a sturdy plant usually left undyed and is used as the basis of the coils that make up the rest of the basket. The coils are woven over with a type of brass known to the Harari as agar agara and to Western botanists as elizuin. These stems, which are often dyed, use a kind of thread to both decorate and finish the basket and hold the structure all together. These baskets are pretty neat. Not only are they pieces of art, but they also have functional and practical uses as well. And they're all handmade too. Here is today's interesting fact. Did you know that those tiny yellow specks on strawberries aren't the seeds? And the sweet flesh we love to eat isn't the actual part of the fruit? It's true! The strawberry is a fruit, but it's not classified in a way you might expect. Despite its name, the strawberry isn't actually a true berry because it lacks the thin skin and pericarp that botany define as a true berry. True berries include grapes, cranberries, even tomatoes and eggplant. Instead, strawberries are what is known as aggregate fruit. Raspberries and blackberries fall into this category as well. And all of these fruits are in the same family as the rose. Aggregate fruits form through merging of multiple reproductive systems inside a single flower. The strawberry grows from the plant's flower, and that sweet red flesh going below the hole is called a receptacle. The flower's white petals reflect ultraviolet light to attract bees who will pollinate the fruit. The receptacle swells and decides to attract the animals, who will eat them and scatter the true fruit. Those tiny yellow specks on the outside of the berry? Those are the actual fruit of the strawberry. The true fruit of the strawberry are what we think as the little seeds. Technically, those small yellow seed-like bits are called 
achneys. Each is a fruit. Inside each achne is the actual strawberry seed. An average strawberry holds about 200 achneys on its surface. And yes, the seeds inside of the achneys are very tiny. So yeah, those yellow specks on the outside of a strawberry aren't seeds. Pretty interesting, huh? Aw, we all know what that song means. It means we reached the end of today's episode of Ability to Learn. I had fun, and I hope you had fun too. But not only had fun, I hope you learned something as well. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you're notified for all the fun here on Ability to Learn. This is Teacher Liz signing out. Farewell, Discovery Learners. I will see you next time. Don't forget to attend the live Zoom sessions provided to you every day by the Discovery Day Program's educational team.